Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Santita Jackson Show on AM 950 Radio, the voice of progressive Minnesota. I am Santita Jackson. It's a joy to be with you early this morning, although it really is Sunday afternoon. We're taping the show today, but I think it's a current story. We'll be talking about this tomorrow. We'll be talking about uh, Iran's retaliation against Israel. What did that mean? Let's frame it properly. Let's see where we go from here. Um, and will this bring America and Iran, uh, excuse me, and Israel, Israel and the United States, will it in this back and forth that we've had, or, 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 what is going on? Let's frame this properly so that you can know what to look for. You know the questions to ask. AM 950 Radio, the voice of Progressive Minnesota is my home station, but we are also on the Santita Jackson Show YouTube channel. Please meet us there and like and subscribe and click the bell so that whenever we come up, you will be notified. But please like and subscribe and share, 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 share the show. I've been getting a lot of DMs and calls from everybody because you all have been sharing the show. And thank you so much for that. Please go to my X page at Santita J, at Santita J. And of course, the Santita Jackson and Friends Facebook page where we are also streaming. So please meet us there. We have got a distinguished panel to talk about uh, what happened last night. Fortunately, no one was killed. Uh, and Iran said, that's not what we were trying to do. We were trying to send you a message. What message were they sending? And although this is not being framed that way, this was in retaliation for uh, the killing of seven of the top military figures at the... Uh, Iranian consulate in Damascus. That is an act of war, everybody. You don't touch embassies. You don't touch their annexes, the consulates. You don't do that. But Israel did that. And they continue to ratchet things up. Why? What are they doing? And what do you think is going on? And where, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? What, what are we doing? What? What are we doing and how will we ever get out of this? When will we be able to have a meaningful peace? Plan? When will we stop having war every single day? When is this going to stop? When, are, when is peace going to begin? Dr. Julian Malvo, world-renowned economist, president emeritus of the Bennett College for Women. Ari Bloomcats, editor, ex executive editor of In These Times magazine. I really do hope, and my fellow bibliophile, I really do hope that he, you will subscribe to his magazine. You get a lot of great investigative work coming out of there. Uh, and of course, one of the world's renowned international law experts, Dr. John Quigley from The Ohio State University. Uh, Josh Feinstein, we're going to bring everybody back. Josh Feinstein from Jewish Voice for Peace Action, that's right, in Michigan. And um, when we'll get everybody else back, gotta get, let me get Doc, let me get you back up. Uh, gotta get Daryl Jones back up, what happened? Gonna add him back to the stage, okay. Daryl Jones, the chairman of the Transformative Justice Coalition. We have got a lot to talk about. Let me find, where's Dr. Quigley, where'd he go? Okay, well, you know, we'll get him back. Okay, got to get him back, got to get him back. But, you know, let me start uh, with you, Ari. You know, as a journalist on this panel, what did we see last night? Well, I think, you know, what we saw last night was a, you know, absolute escalation in what we've been looking at. But I think it tells us a number of things about what's going on. But, you know, it began with the strike in Syria. Um, and this is, of course, like, you know, a very ongoing thing. There's been ongoing war between Israel and Iran, the U.S. and Iran for, you know, decades now. It's just, you know, not as a public like war in general, but there's been assassinations of scientists across the board and sorts of covert operations like happening. So I think like, you know, this idea that this is our new tensions and new blowups is, uh, is not what they are, are tensions that are now being weaponized politically. Um, we are seeing an Israeli government and a U.S. government that are completely beleaguered now over their stances on Gaza, over the genocide, and over the murders of so many thousands of Palestinians right now. And there's no exit strategy at all from this as well. So we're looking at world powers right now that are committing a genocide and not really sure what to do next except for to keep killing, 
to do the thing that they know how to do. We are not, you know, I, I saw this headline in the New York Times about the idea that Biden is trying to be a peacemaker here. And it just made me laugh so much. I mean, he, the idea that people are trying to be peacemakers in this situation is, is absolutely absurd. What we are seeing are genocidal, um, you know, leaders in the process of killing, now engaging on more in more violence in order to maintain their power and to keep killing. And so that's what I saw yesterday was an escalation in that, in what we've seen from really flailing genocidal leaders. Why are they calling this unprecedented, Ari? I mean, just, well, it doesn't seem, it just seems incongruent with what is really going on. It unprecedented, is it because we haven't seen uh, Israel fired upon um, in decades, is that it? I mean, what is it? And it's not being framed as a retaliatory measure. Right, is I mean, Spain is under attack. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the word unprecedented is sort of a funny one sometimes in the journalism business because everything's unprecedented always, and we sort of like sometimes pull it out to try and like underscore that something is interesting, right? And so, like, people say unprecedented, it's a very like good word that plays online very, very well, really gets people engaged in that. And so while like, yes, like some of what we were seeing in terms of the attack, like is like somewhat unprecedented, you know, what I mentioned before is that these are countries that have been at war killing each other's people for a long time now. So the idea like the attacks between the two of them are unprecedented, I think is, um, is you know, not really correct. So, like, you know, I don't think Iran had any illusions that all of these drones and, you know, attacks were not really going to hit anything. That's not re really what this was about um, at all. I think, you know, what we are seeing that is unprecedented is a genocide of Palestinians and, you know, honestly, fascist leaders who are now trying to hold on and maintain power in order that they can complete genocide and ethnic cleansing. Like that project is not yet complete. And, you know, the Israeli fascist government needs to complete this, this genocide project to maintain their power, to maintain their control. And, um, and Biden is, you know, along for every step of the ride here, you know, enabling, fueling, funding, all of it. Mm, Josh Feinstein, Jewish Voice for Peace Action, Michigan. Well, you really got things rolling in this campaign season. Looking for 10,000 votes in 21 days, you got 101,000. Now, more than half a million Americans have said they are committed to being uncommitted and uninstructed, and they want a ceasefire. And yet we're watching war amp up. So, look, as a peace activist, I don't, there's so many qualified panels here today, that for me to talk about the calculus of how we got here and such, I think there's people who could speak better to it. What I could talk about maybe is my own personal experience, Santita, of being in Beirut uh, over the summer in the living room of my wife's family's home, and an Israeli missile just passes over by and hits the house down the street and kills three people. I get up, I make sure everyone's okay. I run into the balcony. There's my, my stepfather smoking a cigarette. He was totally not faced. As he said, why? He said, happens all the time. That's what the Israelis do. They don't believe the international law applies to them. And then I fast forward uh, to the attack um, on the Iranian embassy in Syria. And again, international law is flouted. And I'm going to be heading to Beirut in uh in a month or two, because I'm a New Yorker. To me, I feel very at home at Beirut. It's like New York, it's a melting pot. There's all different types of people, right? And again, I'm bringing it down just to a personal thing because that's something I can talk to. Living in quote, in an area where there's a melting pot um, in Beirut, seeing what happened from my own selfish point of view was, you know something? Am I going to be a statistic at the end of this trip mm -hmm. uh, coming up? Now, what happened yesterday, I'm not here to take sides and I excuse it. What I do know is that the message that was sent to the Israelis is you are not the victim. You are the victimizers. Please stop. Stop the genocide. Stop attacking and assassinating people 
with just willy nilly. I even use the word willy nilly. I apologize. It's not even appropriate. But so I see it just from a personal lens of honestly, after yesterday, if the leaders in Israel are thinking in terms of humanitarian terms, then I might feel safer going. Here's the problem. The problem is that probably the I don't know what the calculus is, but the calculus is might likely to kind of, yeah, just keep going and keep going. And one, you know, that old saying, one nuclear war can ruin your whole day. At that point, it won't matter who started it, who is right, who is wrong. We all grew up during the Cold War. We know where it goes next. So that's my comment on it from a, from a personal point of view. I hope that makes sense to, to you and, and the other panelists. I think it does make sense. I mean, because look, we were all watching television because... Thankfully, we're not there. And then, you know, as we're calling for ceasefire, as you're watching the uncommitted uh, movement grow, uh, as we're watching more and more people looking for peace, and then you see, Dr. Malvo, what Israel has always wanted. America, perhaps, is on the precipice of going to war with Iran. Now, I'm listening to Washington Journal on C-SPAN in the morning, Attorney Terry O'Neill, and everybody is, you know, when they open up the phone lines for an hour in the morning. And then I listen to other radio shows and I try to I read the comments, Ari. Uh, Americans don't have, Americans increasingly don't want to fund Ukraine. They don't want to fund Israel. They don't want to fund anybody. They want to get funded themselves. They are tired of these wars. I mean, the ground has shifted, Dr. Malvo. It, I just think that it's, it's a different time. And I'm wondering if the power structure really gets it. What I, don't do think they like? do. I, I don't think they get it at all. Um, I mean, there's drilling down on Ukraine, especially. Um, Lou Mike Johnson, the speaker, the House speaker, has trotted himself down to Mar-a-Lago. Uh, to talk to the orange man, and um, not the orange man, the former president. Like, come on. Well, okay. No, no. You know what? I only say this, and I'm going to say this once again. During President Obama's presidency, he was so disrespected. I mean, it was just something we had not seen, and maybe, but not maybe. I had grown up in public life. You, you, you know me, Dr. Malvo, since I was a kid, and I've seen people be unkind to to my father and to then my brothers and my mother and even, please even to me they you know because people if you if you're in the public people think they can take shots at you and they they can be rather unkind i just don't want to do that and plus knowing your spirit i mean you're one of the most generous people i know you could have peeled off with your credentials and you could have made a whole lot of money you've never been interested in that you want to educate kids every have most of 99% of what you do is you're not paid for <laughs> no, <thought>. that's true. <laughs> I mean, and here I'm getting MIT brand economic information, <laughs> and I can get it for free. All I have to do is call you, and you will say you'll be upset with people if they don't call you. So that's why I want us to resist this because I think we're even personalizing what's happening with Netanyahu. You know, with Netanyahu, you can change persons, but if you're not going to change policies, there's no difference. Well, and I'm that, afraid that as we're pushing to change him, they're not going to change policies and more people are going to die. And the biggest open air prison in the world is going to, might be shifted to Egypt. It's a mess, Dr. Malvo. It's a mess. You no, know, it's, it's an utter mess. And I don't think they get it. And you're, you're right. I think that, you know, I can't resist. I don't have very much respect for the former president. I just really don't uh, for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's earned it. No, I, mean, I, I hear you. I guess I just want to, I want to keep it. Okay, let's in, let's let's, in let's power, keep it in policy. I think that's important because if we look at the Republican Party, it's easy to blame the former president for a number of things, but he couldn't do what he does unless there was, you know, trees don't basically trees don't grow unless somebody planted seeds for them, <laughs> and um, he basically. Um, is a part of a long, long continuum of a rightward sh uh, shift of an anti-foreign policy shift. He's the he's the end of the of a continuum. It didn't start with him. We've seen that. So I know. I, but you the question you asked was, do they get it? No, they don't get it. They don't get it at all. And so because they don't get it, what we see is um, I was watching what's his name, 
the guy who wrote the hillbilly uh, hillbilly elegy oh jd vance the senator yeah. vance from ohio yeah i was watching him on um something this morning cnn and mm -hmm. um he was taught, he, his point was, you know, we don't want to do money for this. We don't want to do money for that. What about all the people? And a lot of people are feeling the same way. When you have uh, inflation uh, at three point something percent, much lower than it was a year ago, but still at three point, I think five now, went up a little bit, not enough to have a throw a fit over, but it went up a little bit. When you have that, when you add that to um, just wages not going up, people are like, what about me? That's that's sort of the prevailing thought among a lot of people who earn less than fifty thousand dollars a year. So what about me? Why why isn't anyone paying attention to me? But meanwhile, this conflict has the possibility of turning into a world conflict. We could find ourselves in another world war. I say we could. I don't say we will. We could, with the international community taking sides. Um, blessedly, I think. Um, People have basically called Netanyahu on the carnage and on the deaths of 30,000 plus Palestinians, mm -hmm. called him on it. Um, you know, the Bible says an eye for an eye, but I just wrote something. He said, well, he believes in an eye for 20 eyes. So when you look at the magnitude of what's going on, people are, people are beginning to pay attention. But that, but, and the Iranian attack on Israel is put when you put it in context, it makes unfortunately perfect sense for them. Well, I mean, well, let me ask you this: Was it an attack or, or retaliation? There you go, there you go, and it depends on how you look at it. I would say it's a retaliation, and that's thank you for for correcting that. Well, I would say it's a retaliation. No, I'm just, I'm just. It's not even correcting; it's reframing because we can all make that slip, Doctor Malvo, because that's what you're hearing on in corporate media attack, attack, attack. I'm like, no, this is a retaliation. You all took out seven of their generals. You did what is in diplomatic circles. You know this, Dr. Malvo, unforgivable. You don't you don't bomb a consulate. Exactly. Or what would we do if somebody <laughs> bombed one of ours? Yeah. You know, just think about it. It, it. But even more than that, um, Israel has all too frequently been the aggressor. They don't pay attention to international law. Is their way or the highway. I will take you way back down memory lane. I graduated from Boston College in 1974. And I wrote my senior honors thesis. There were three books that international um, commanders wrote after they had basically been in the Middle East. And they, you to a person, to a Scandinavian fellow, I remember what was from Denmark, what was from the European countries, they all wrote that. Israel just did not pay attention to international law. They did what they felt like doing whenever they felt like doing it. And they leaned on the empathy that so many people have about the Holocaust. And we all should be horrified about the Holocaust, of course. But they lean on that empathy to say, see, we don't have a homeland. See, everybody's picking on us. See, we have a right to exist. Well, your existence came from taking somebody else's land. And that was never actually adjudicated reconciled or anything like that. So you have people, and then, you, so you you were established, got the land, then you just kept encroaching, kept encroaching, putting settlements on land that already belonged to Palestinian people. And again, with no consequences. And so with no consequences, there are a whole lot of people in that area who are very upset with Israel and who are not inclined. I mean, you have generations of rancor around the way that Israel has been established. And one of the things I always like to say, it's not funny, but it kind of is, initially they thought they would establish Israel in Uganda. In Uganda. Now imagine that. The Mau Mau's would not have that. Um, the Mau Mau's, and use my, let me use my body, Mau Mau's would not be having that. But that's that was the initial plan. Mm -hmm. And then they sort of you know, because of the Holy Land, because of Jerusalem, for a number of other reasons, they end up shifting. But that was plan A. So basically, international forces were determined to create a homeland for Jewish people. That's not inappropriate. What's inappropriate is to figure out where it was done, whose voices were on the table. Balfour, you know, basically, the Balfour Declaration said, create a space. But nobody said which space. And so that's that's the origin of this conflict. And the consistent 
rejection of a two-state solution is again at the at the base of this conflict. What where do to eliminate Hamas, Israel has to eliminate a large number of Palestinian people as they have done, as they have but done. You know, but 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 Dr. Malvo, they helped to build Hamas because they didn't want it. They wanted to divide. Yeah, because they didn't want the PLO. They didn't want the and PLO. They, they, didn't want, they didn't want to deal with Arafat. So I mean, right. acting as if Hamas, Hamas is almost acting as if they're in partnership because everything they're doing has helped Israel. I mean, it's just, it's almost like they're of two minds. It's, it's something bizarre going on here. For the benefit and, of your listeners, I know everyone in the panel is yeah. aware of it, for the benefit of your listeners, you know, Netanyahu always built himself as the great defender of Israel. What he was doing was he said, oh, I've got the Palestinian Authority, I've got Hamas. Let's keep them both weak. The way I'll do that is I'm going to fund Hamas. What's the worst that could happen? And he kept on funding Hamas and eventually came back to bite him. Now, in terms of that, I think regardless of where you fall on the spectrum of this morally, I think it shows that Netanyahu, even if you are a staunch supporter of Israel, it shows that the decisions that Netanyahu makes ultimately does not make the Israelis safer and does not make anyone in the world safer. If you think about last night, you know, yes, Iran spent political capital and thank God no one, was, except for, I, I'm sorry to say a young girl was, was injured, but no one was actually killed. Thank mm -hmm. God. But we... Taxpayers of the United States spent $1.3 billion last night in a situation, $1.3 billion was spent. And I'm glad that the net result is no one was hurt. But imagine a world where the Israeli leadership was such that it was able to actually work through disagreements, work through conflicts, so that we can take those $1.3 billion and then to your listeners, funnel that back home where we need the money for things here yeah. instead, uh, instead of there. Uh, I cede my time. <laughs> I hope that no, no, but Josh, it's a really important I mean, point that you made about he's making a great point, Dr. Malvo, because more you no. hear this frequently, more and more frequently from Americans. They're like, Look, I can't afford eggs, I can't afford to buy a chicken, I mean, I can't afford my groceries, I can't afford my rent. I absolutely I can't even think about buying a house, I can't send my children to college, I can't even give them bus fare to get. To school. Increasingly, Americans are looking at, I mean, Americans are looking at our foreign policy expenditures and contrasting them to what's happening at home. And the other contrast we have to make, and I, I really appreciate the point, brother, because I think when you look at the amount of money, and let's be clear, Israel gets $3.3 billion at least from the United States every year. Off the top. Billion. For, the top. for military aid, $3.3 yeah. Think about what that could mean in terms of schools. In terms, we still, we've still got schools of lead in them. We, you know, we had a bridge here that in Baltimore that collapsed. And of course, if there was a lot of human error involved, but what else was involved was the ignoring of our infrastructure. About 20% of our bridges presently are in trouble. 20%, one in five bridges. That could have happened almost anywhere um, because we that bridge is 50 some, almost 60 years old, hasn't been um, properly maintained because of finance. So the money that we, and, and Israel, again, Israel basically uses the horror of the Holocaust to stay in the mix around how, why they deserve, deserve money and support from the United States. And we oh, we have a little bit of guilt, and we, we they they basically use that guilt because there was a time at the during World War II where we could have done more to prevent mm -hmm. the Holocaust, and we did it. Uh, we could have had more Jewish people come here, um, and we did it. We and so, yeah. So 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 people are guilty, but guilt in a quarter will get won't even get you a paper. We, the guilt is appropriate, and from a but if you want to be guilty, let's get guilty about enslavement or something. I mean. In fact, history leaves bones on the ground. That's mm -hmm. just how history is. That does not justify the carnage that Israel has um, committed. Nor did it, you know that there was a piece on CNN, Santita, where these two uh, Israeli women. There was a convoy coming through, and these two women put their bodies in front of the convoy and said they wanted Palestinians to starve. Yeah. Starve. I mean, and I looked at these women. They were middle-aged women. They looked like one of my neighbors. Um, 
And I'm saying, what? where does that hatred come from? And again, the Netanyahu team has been ginning that up. In contrast, probably the same day, it was a day that I was in a good mood, so I watched TV all day. Uh, there was a little girl, a Palestinian girl, who's like sleeping on the floor or the ground. And she was begging the reporter for water. Oh. She said, they only give us half a bottle because there's not enough to go around. Now we have this idyllic notion of childhood and we always talk about it, you know, in the black church, we sing that, I believe that children were the future, uh, but which children are we talking about? And so Amer we have turned a blind eye. We've turned an utter blind eye mm -hmm. to reality around you know, what's going on, you know, basically in the Middle East. And Brother Biden, for all his good qualities, um, is literally myopic about his support of Israel. He has to put it in context. We shouldn't send another weapon until there's some kind of agreement about those weapons are being used for. No, until there is an absolute agreement on a, on not a, on the ceasefire. Yes. And I, quite frankly, I think the ask was too small. You know, you got to go back to the two state solution. I mean, there's just there's just a whole lot. I see Dr. Quigley has joined us once again, but and so but I want to hear from you, Terry O'Neill, because now we're looking at mm, uh, th the way it's being framed. It's an attack upon Israel, right? And it's like, come on, you guys, this is a retaliatory move. And if we if we continue to frame the frame these stories and these issues incorrectly, we're never going to move, Attorney O'Neill. We're just not. I, I hear you, Cynthia. I think that's exactly right. And, um, and you know, from where I'm sitting, you have a prime minister of Israel who is doing things that he thinks will keep him out of prison. He is under criminal mm -hmm. indictment. Um, he is not that different from kleptocratic, uh, autocratic rulers such as in the, in, in the, in the mold of Putin um, and Trump. And, 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 and he sees political advantage to himself in committing a genocide uh, against Gaza. Why? In part because we know that um, he intends to parcel that land out. Like, like, like the United States, the white people in the United States did to the Native Americans when Andrew Jackson was president, our genocidal president himself, pushing Native Americans out of land that was then doled out to white settlers. That is exactly what Netanyahu is trying to do in Gaza. That, that's my opinion. And, and I think that Mr. Feinstein said he is making Israelis much less safe um, in, in the process, but he's not just making Israelis less safe. He is making Jews all over the world less safe, right? And, and look, Hannah Arendt, the brilliant, amazing theorist, did not think that the establishment of Israel was the right response to the Holocaust. It was it was a controversial idea when it happened. It did happen, but but it, it, sure, her point was Israel is not going to keep Jews around the world safe. That is that is just not going to be the answer. What we have to do is find a way of governance in countries around the country around the globe that recognize different people's religious and and uh, and ethnic identities to be protected. That's what you need. If you translate that to the Middle East right now, what you should have had for the past 30, 40 years is a democratic state of Israel recognizing the fundamental human rights of Arab Israelis, which they have not done since Netanyahu came into power in the 1990s. Um, you should have a true democracy. Israel is no more a democracy than the state of Tennessee is a democracy. I live in Tennessee. <laughs> we are not a democracy. <laughs> they don't allow black people to vote down here. Okay, Israel is not a democracy. And and the the way forward, it seems to me, is to have an actual democracy where it is not the plutocrats and the billionaires that are making decisions in their own best interest. And notice that these billionaires and plutocrats are not trying to take. Putin out. They're not trying to take Netanyahu out. They're not trying, trying to take Trump out. They see an advantage to themselves in having these, these dangerous death-dealing men in charge of, of, of these countries and vast arsenals uh, of military weaponry. So that's kind of what it looks like to me right now. I, I, I think, um, I, and, I, and I worry 
because you, th you think the Holocaust can't happen again, of course it can happen again. For some reason, Jews are a sort of a special case of hate, right? It's, and it, it's, a, it's an exterminatory hate, not like the hate that white people ginned up against African-Americans to, to justify slavery, to justify the exploitation of workers but based on their skin color. That's a different, you're talking about extermination level hate that will that will absolutely bubble up again uh against jews and netanyahu is 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 paving the way for that in my personal opinion i'd like to uh dovetail with what uh, mrs o'neill said in terms of anti-semitism and also uh, uh dr malvo had mentioned about the holocaust so i want to make clear you know anti-semitism is real and i've actually encountered it i've also encountered holocaust deniers and when I do encounter real anti-Semitism or I encounter Holocaust deniers, I respectfully put them in their place, is rightly so. The problem is that what is taking place right now, as Terry O'Neill very eloquently put forth, is the actions of the Israeli government in Netanyahu is making us as Jews less safe in the long run. But and does I, he know that, Josh? I don't think he cares. I think he's actually, I don't know what he thinks, but I'm trying to put myself in that sort of that a sociopathic demagoguery position, I'd be thinking, how do I keep power and stay out of jail? This is the point. The answer here, so we talked about the problem. I think the answer I'm going to put out to your listeners, if there's any Jewish listeners out there, and it's, it's going to sound hokey, I'm going to float it anyway. According, if you really look forward, Israel is something that exists, but it exists inside of all of us. And I know that sounds dorky and it sounds hokey, but once Jews realize that actually we carry Israel inside of us, and that by carrying inside and, and adhering to tikkun olam and adhering to lifting the world up and perpetuating Israel that way, that is what will make the Jews safe in the long run. Not perpetuating a genocide because we're afraid that it might happen again to us. I hope that makes sense. And thank you, Mr. O'Neill and Dr. Malvo, for your comments. Well, it's not linear. It's metaphysical, but I'm here for it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no, no, because I mean, no, because it's it's true. We all, we carry these principles with us. I don't think we understand that. It's to everybody's chosen. I don't believe mm -hmm. that God, or that just, that doesn't work. You know, it's just that thinking. And I think we're at a time in the world, Daryl, and I, I'm so glad you're back, Dr. Quigley, where people are gonna have to grow up in their thinking, grow spiritually, grow up politically, just grow up. And embrace, you know, what did Dr. King say? See each man, woman, as each man and woman, just see each other, see each other. And I, I mean, I see myself in you, Dr. Malvo and Attorney uh, O'Neill and Josh and Ari and Daryl and Dr. Quigley. I mean, I see myself in you and, uh, you know, and when we grow up, we, we see ourselves in each other. We do. It's just, you know, and so when I, when I'm trying to figure, figure this thing out, and then I see uh, you blow up. I mean, those seven military, the, the people, the, 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 the top military officials from Iran, you don't have to like them, but that was somebody. Okay. Santina. Santina is going out, but I know she was trying to talk to Daryl uh, Jones about this. She, she was posing a question to you, Daryl. So why don't you take it uh, as she comes back? Take it away, Daryl. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, Dr. Malvo and, and the other panelists, you know, one of the things that I keep asking myself, and I, and I imagine, you know, when I went to, to Israel, I realized I landed in an area where all the uh, countries that surrounded me did not like me, did not want me there. So it, it was almost a, a feeling of, of being in an area where, you know, there's just always tension. There's always tension. And when I run through that analysis, I, I ask myself, and I think this is where Santita uh, was headed, I ask myself, how do I get to a position where we all get along, where, where you don't really just want me removed and that we can benefit and love one another and, and at least get along? And, you know, and I begin with that analysis and I sit back and I say, well, it, it doesn't happen when you're you know, basically committing genocide in Gaza. Right. Yeah. It, it doesn't happen when when you kill the the leaders, the seven leaders that are that are in uh, that are in Iran in, in the bombing. There just seems to be uh, this big question in my mind: How 
does this get resolved? Yeah, how do we get to the point? How do we get to the point where we really can sit there and have a two-state solution discussion or a discussion about how everyone in that region is going to work out? And the U.S., you know, of course, we're, we're over top of all of this and we're spending, I think it was, uh, uh, Josh, I was saying $1.3 billion in a day when, you know, that could have been just an oh enormous really? amount of good oh, within okay. the United States. Okay. So it, it, it really does, you know, beg that question, you know, what what's the answer? You know, what are the steps to the solution? We all see the problem, but what are the, what are the practical steps? To the solution in this situation, and I don't know what that is, because you know it, it's it's you know being in the middle of that heat, but understanding that you're there and that you got to navigate it some type of way. So yeah, you know, so that that's sort of where I am on this. And I listen, you know, all the Netanyahu stuff is no different than yeah you know, any other president that's in trouble. They're going to do what they got to do, right, to, to to try to stay out of prison, stay in power. That's what he's doing. Does it make the um, Israeli people safer? No. Huh. But the question then becomes, as you were saying, Dr. Malvo, how, how do we get everyone along? How, how does it work out? What, what are the steps to resolving the issues that are there? And I just don't know what that is right now. I, I, and I'm completely lost. Let's ask, Dr. Let's ask Dr. Quigley to come in. The Santita, I think, is coming back with me. Well, Dr. Quigley, we haven't heard from you at all. So from your perspective, Daryl just asked the question, how do, we, how do we get there? What's your position, sir? Well, the, the problem is that a population of people was brought in from, from outside and displaced the, the people who were there. <laughs> uh, how do you remedy that? I mean, there's really no way to do that. I mean, the people have already been run out of their country. A, a new set mm. of people are there. Um, I mean, I could say, well, uh, let the people who were run out come back. Um, you know, maybe that would help, um, but I, it doesn't really remedy Unbelievable. What, what was done before. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't really see a good way <laughs> to do what Daryl is, is asking. Uh, you can have two states. You can have a, a, a Palestine state in Gaza and, and the West Bank. Um, um, and then you could say, well, uh, you know, add on, bring back the people who left. Of course, most of them are dead by now. Uh, it's their, their, their progeny who, who are alive, uh, who might or might not want, want to come back. Um, uh, but, but in Gaza in particular, you do mm -hmm. have a huge quantity of people, um, uh, that I think would go back. Um, uh, two thirds of the population of Gaza consists of people that were forced out of their home areas in 1948. Um, I mean, that, that's the essential problem uh, in, in Gaza. I mean, these are people who were victimized long before anything that happened last October. Um, uh, yes. So, Dr. Quigley, I think I really appreciate the fact that you see it from this global, geo, global political point of view about the big answer. I think in terms of for those of us, you know, on, on the ground, I would just submit one. I would say, Dr. Malvo, that when we talk about the problem and the role that we're playing, I, I quote, feel that I'm playing a game of inches when things are happening in leaps and bounds. Like I'm, we're trying to make yeah. a different state. And that's, but that being said, that doesn't mean to give up. I always harp on the ideas. Let's focus on down ballot. Let's figure out who's spending money and who's making money there, and then put our attention towards those specific actions and go after that, whether it's a down ballot race or as simple as making sure not to purchase products that we believe go oh, into okay. uh, killing people, uh, you know, that fund killing people. Those are the, for the listeners out there, those are the steps we can take to begin to be part of the solution. You know, you know um, Jewish Voices for Peace, I mean, I, I love I love the notion of Jewish folks who are talking about peace. What kind of solutions are y'all putting out there? Uh, what What do you think ought to happen from a from a Jewish perspective? I, I have a dear friend, and we just we're not speaking at the moment, but we'll speak tomorrow because um, I'm writing a piece about children, Palestinian Gazan children, 
and he doesn't think I should write it, but that's okay. It's a dictate what I write. And he says, well, what about the Israeli children? Well, you know, what I'd like to see is some equivalency. Oh, boy, okay. Well, let's see if what, I can leave what the studio. You, what That'll help. What well, well, Dr. Malvo, first thing is, um, just the old disclaimer. I'm not going to speak for JVP National, you know, that they have their own thing. I, I can speak, though, as a proud American Jewish person, that it is very simple to me is to, in terms of the solution, the idea, work towards a permanent ceasefire, work towards Palestinian self-determination, i.e., we're not going to prescribe what the Palestinians need or should need. We just have the obligation to create that space they can do so. And then the third part is work towards changing America's policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis how it deals with Israel and funds Israel. To me, it is that simple in terms of what the goals are or what should be done. Everything else follows from there. Does that make sense, Dr. Malvo? It, it makes absolute sense. I think especially the um, the way that the United States has dealt with Israel, basically giving it a free pass at every occasion when it violates international law. Um, but, you know, you have a Biden, you have a, Sh I mean, B Biden Schumer came to Jesus late. But they did come when Schumer said, uh-uh, enough. Um, but I think changing the policy and changing the mindset, and I quite frankly would also say, um, and you can help me with this, do something about APAC, because they basically, they have, they're, not only are they Israel's passionate defenders, but they have raised $100 million to get rid of progressive members of Congress who say the slightest, mildest thing that they see as, anti-Israel, being anti-Israel or not anti, but critical of Israel does not mean anti-Semitic. They're not the same thing. I mean, so in terms of APAC, first, I want to turn over to the other panelists because I think especially uh, the other panelists would have a, uh, a good insight. I, I do just want to say that let's remember that APAC's power is not enabled being able to elect people, but able to make, enable to stop people from getting elected. That's a big difference. So we have a lot of down ballot candidates where we honestly we don't have much money. You know, we don't we don't have APAC money. But in a world where there's social media, that there are ways to counter APAC in these upcoming elections. With that, I mean, um, Mr. Blumenkatz, do you have any am, am I are, are Dr. Balvo and I oversimplifying it in terms of solution, or do you think that we're onto something here? Well, I, I mean there are a number of things, like you know, AVP has, you know, a multi-pronged. Um, and multi-level, you know, theories of change and philosophy about best ways to go about change here. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's um, a number of other things regarding APAC. There's been a whole coalition that's come together um, to, uh, to fight that. But I actually want to take a step back. I think um, the white men here have spoken a little much. And I think maybe Sorry. the should be open. <laughs> Well, guys, we're improvising because Santina is, fl is flowing in and out. And so we got to do a little improvising here. And I appreciate everybody. Um, another life, I sometimes do radio, as does uh, attorney Daryl Jones. And so we understand when the technology devils get in the mix, we just got to play it. And we're going to do that. Um, Santina will text me if she wants me to do something differently. And I want to go back to, uh, uh, to Terry because... Uh, you, you you basically laid it out, I think, you know, very, very well. Um, but what's your solution? I mean, we, we're we talking two-state solution. Do you see us possibly ever getting to that? No. I, I First of all, I don't think there's a two-state solution possible right now because who is going to be the state for the Palestinian people? They have been... The, the, Israel has, and and other Arab states, Egypt has not been a friend to Palestinian people. Jordan has not been a friend to them. So so there's no really strong, how, how are the Palestinians really going to be protected and safe in a two-state system? That's number one. But number two, I really believe in democracy. I think that democracy is essential to rein in what I call white patriarchal capitalism, uh, which is currently killing us. It's setting the world on fire. It's doing a lot of bad things. Patriarch, I mean, um, Democracy is, is a good thing. And, and so I think what needs to happen is Israel needs to become a democratic nation. It needs to become a democratic nation governed by United Nations humanitarian norms. Um, and, and, and if it does that, then people who live within the territorial boundaries of that, of that place have a vote. They have a say. They have civil rights. They have the right to to um, 
uh, worship as they please. They they have the, they don't have the right to commit pogroms against other religious groups, right? But you have you, you what you need is a true functioning democracy, a one state solution. But that state cannot be a state that exists only for Jews as 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 a compensation for the whole cost. It has to be an actual nation with actual rights and responsibilities on the planet. So you think a one person one vote type solution? Um, in, in, in the land. So the things that have happened to Palestinians in terms of being pushed off their land, um, these random arrests of young uh, Palestinians, they're just a, just a, just a litany of uh, with civil rights violations. Um, and and then, the, then the question becomes, and I'll go back to, if Santita doesn't come back, I'll go back to Dr. Quigley, because if that's, if we all agree to that, I don't think we all yeah. did, then, how do we get there? Who starts it? Does the UN play a big role? Does the US play a big role? Does anybody trust the US anymore, given some of the things that we've done, Dr. Kim Quigley? Yeah, um, I think we're between a rock and a hard place here. Um, uh, that that you could do what, what uh, Terry O'Neill is suggesting, having a, a single space there in which everyone is equal. Um, uh, the question would be, would people really be equal? I mean, even if you give one, everybody a vote, that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, uh, that there's going to be equality. Um, but uh, I mean, many people are suggesting that general approach to things out of a, a, a feeling that having two separate states won't, won't work. Um, the, the, the difficulty with doing away with a separate Palestine state is that uh, Palestine would not have access to the international community. Uh, the, the Palestinians would be submerged in whatever governing structure develops there. And if it is uh, more or less in the hands of the Jewish population, uh, that means that, that the Palestinians are, uh, are, are deprived of an avenue uh, that they presently have, even though I have to admit it's not doing them a great deal of, of good. Um, uh, but it, it's the only thing they have at, at this point. Daryl. What do you think about what Terry has just said? Well, you know, I think there, I appreciate what Terry has said. And I tell you, one of the uh, things that I find really interesting, though, uh, uh, Doctor, it, it is this, is that I think there gets a, there comes to a point where a one-state solution isn't a possibility either. And I, I think there comes to a point when, you know, you've killed my children. You've killed my children's friends. I, I don't know how I then say we can be one. You know, I, I, I don't know how we get to that point. And so, you know, the concern becomes that because the, uh, you know, the disappointment, the anger uh, over what has been brewing for, you know, for an extended period of time has now toppled over where you're, you know, uh, you know where, where you're killing the kids. And you're killing all these other people, and, and really, you know, all that's going on. I don't know how you get to a point of saying that you know we're going to be able to now try to work something out, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I, I say, that's how good. does it end? How, where do we go from here? Is this the reason that the United States position, perhaps, is that you know let's just try to protect? Israel and de-escalate everything that's in the region because it's not going to be possible to to have some type of a uh, solution that's workable for that reason. You know, so I appreciate what what, what Terry said, but I, I just don't know um, that that's possible given the history and the and the current actions of, of what's going on. I, I'm just not quite there. I, can I, I just, I, I see that. I, I really do. And I, I completely understand it. And I think there's a strong analogy here to what uh, white settlers did a hundred years ago, hundred and some odd years ago to Native Americans living in North America. 
Um, and, and fast forward to today, there's a land back movement that is a very, that, that is really interesting and well thought through um, uh, movement that, that I'm hoping will gain traction. Um, there are ways to deal with that unbelievable injustice of a genocide. And what you're talking about is Israel is currently committing genocide, I believe, against uh, Palestinians in Gaza, same as we committed genocide against Native Americans um, uh, in, in this country. So what is the solution today? Well, well, this country isn't doing a very good job of coming up with a solution, but actually some great thinkers in the Native American community are coming up with great solutions. And the solutions have to do with, we are all occupying this territory together. We need to be able to work something out that allows, um, that allows Native American communities to, uh, to, to, to reclaim their culture that that genocide is intended to destroy and has and had did, did a you know near complete destruction. So so there are things that can be done, and and the most important point, of course, and this is really this is really pie in the sky, but I'm going to say it: the people who have been aggressed upon must be the ones who are shaping the solution. So it, it really asks Palestinians what they want. A lot of Palestinians, what they want is jobs in Israel. You know, as much as Israel has been doing this horrible apartheid regime for 30 years, Palestinians want justice, they want jobs, they want the ability to create their own companies and their own businesses. They want to be able to thrive in that place. And most Palestinians are not are not eager to commit genocide against the Jews in Israel. And I would add, most Jews in Israel are not eager to commit, pal to commit genocide against Palestinians either. So, so you know, I, I, I get that it's difficult, but I, it seems to me that um, I saw a map recently that showed the level of illegal settlements that Netanyahu has allowed um, uh, extremists in Israel to create. Not allowed, but, uh, but encouraged. And encouraged, absolutely, and funded and encouraged. You, there is no map for a Palestinian state anymore. That land is currently occupied by well-armed uh, extremist settlers um, in, in Israel. There's there's no map for Palestinians. So uh, so that's a, that's a major reason, I think, the two states. Which states? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm back, you guys. Yeah. Great, great, great. Great. I'm glad great. that you all continue. I, I understand that you continued the conversation, yes? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. yes. Has Dr. Quigley been able to jump in? Oh yeah, a bit. Uh, well, you know what? It, to to Terry to Terry O'Neill's point, you remember he was at the UN last fall, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and he presented a map of the New Middle East, and there was no Palestine. Mm -hmm. So right. you know, I mean, so you know, fundamental. I mean, so I mean, you're right on it. I think that everybody is on it. Um, what I will say this because um, I think we'll just go another ten minutes just to, because I'm going to give them that, but I, I trust the conversation was wonderful. I guess what is, um, what is disturbing to me, what's distressing is that I see us going down a very da dangerous path, you know, and, you know, the Bible tells, you know, you choose to stay whom you will serve, you know, and, and, you know, halt thou between two decisions. I mean, and a double-minded man is in all, is unstable in all of his ways. I mean, what we're doing is really, mm -hmm. I, I'm very hopeful, but I'm also seeing us making some really deadly choices. And that when I see what's happening there, I think the Middle East is such an opportunity for us to really work out some fundamental questions of humanity. I really, I think that America has had that opportunity with indigenous people. Mm -hmm. It's had it with black people. I heard Reverend Jackson some years ago talk about this uh, the biblical experience that Black people have had in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. The Nile River that you see in the Bible was our Mississippi River. Oh, uh, if that river could speak, how many bodies would be there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, oh, this, it was a series of speeches, Dr. Malvo, and they were so powerful. He gave them about 25 years ago. They were so powerful, just and we, we we have these opportunities that all human beings have to get it right. And, you know, because I think that each group of us represent something in the human spirit, whether it's intellect or creativity, something, something, something. And all, when we pull it all together, we represent the best of humanity. And we're, we're missing that. 
you know, we're, we're missing that. You know, I just... And so when I saw these bombs flying and I saw as Iran did not, if they wanted to kill a lot of people, they could have done that. Mm -hmm. They didn't mm -hmm. do that. They said, we're sending you a warning. Mm -hmm. And what disturbs me about the West, Dr. Malvo and Ari Bloomcats and Josh Feinstein and uh, Daryl Jones and Terry O'Neill and attorney John and uh, Dr. John Quigley is that they're not understanding that the that it is a new day. The ground has shifted beneath our feet. The dollar is no longer going to be the sole super dollar in the in the world. It's not that's over. The people who were oppressed are rising up. That's real, mm -hmm. and we need to understand it's a new day. These young kids, they have a new idea of America, and they have gone down the street, and they're going to have it. Mm -hmm. We had jo we had Jonah Karsh on here from If Not Now, um, maybe a little more than a month ago. He said, you don't understand. I'm not 25. The world that you all have, I don't want it, and I'm not going to have it. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. Genocide, I'm not with it. I don't care what I was taught. You know, identity yeah. politics has, for all of us, I'm not. I'm I'm happy that you got the first black this that another. I'm look, I've seen black faces in high places do more damage to everybody. I'm over that. If you're not going to carry the your your oppressed experience, not to oppress others, but to say I don't want this to happen to anyone ever again. I don't want to hear it. Well, you know, Santini, you're so right about the world shifting. Um, in Push Excel, we have a board member, uh, Dr. Donna Leak, and she is on the Illinois um, Board of Education, the Illinois State Board of Education. And she exposed us to the two young people, the two high school students who sit on that board. And one young lady was so amazingly impressive because in, in the context of book banning, she said she wanted to learn. She didn't want to have knowledge take, taken away from her. She mm -hmm. said, I feel more strongly about learning American history. This is what the child said. She was 17 years old. American mm -hmm. history, which includes black history, I'm more interested in that than learning algebra. Now, as a math person, economist, I'm like, eh, I don't know about, about the algebra. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that <laughs> she, yeah. she wanted to know all history. And that's uh, many mm -hmm. younger people are basically pushing back against their elders who say, we're banning books, we're committing uh, genocide, we're doing predatory capitalism, we're running over people. And so that's why they want to ban books, because if, if, if you can brainwash young people into joining this anti-humanistic -human, movement, if you can brainwash young people into doing that, mm -hmm. then you don't really have to do anything. I mean, what did uh, Jose Andres, when the uh, Bread for the World, uh, Bread for the World, uh, this is anti-humanitarian. -human, yeah. Bombing people who are going to, killing people who are going to bring food. They're not going to bring anything but food. So using food as a weapon of war is absurd. And you can only get away with it if you brainwash enough people to think of, of Palestinians as the other. Then, or black people other anyone as the other or jewish people as other i mean i mean muslim hindus i mean come on we everybody gets their chance to be demonized and it's it's just it's not working it's mm -hmm. not working and humanity won't survive it i'm gonna go around and get closing thoughts i am sorry for my technical difficulties but because the reason i produce this show and curate it in this way is because i know that you all can carry on without me <laughs> and well, I want the audience to know that each of you exists and that there are people out there who care and who are thinking in ways that you don't see the punditry thinking. Some people are really beholden to a little bit more than a party. I mean, mm. beholden to principles. And I, that's why I reach out to you, because I think that you do have empathy for all people. And that's what I love about each and every single one of you. So I'm going to get closing thoughts from everybody. Um, I, I did not hear you, Attorney Daryl Jones. In a minute, can you kind of button this up for, for me? Oh, absolutely, Santina. It's just a great conversation uh, that we did have. And, and I will say this, 
you know, I, I hope that the radio audience takes away from the conversation we've had the difficulty and the complexity of trying to deal with the situation of what's happening in the Middle East and how to reach a, a resolution and the uh, the you know the enormous job that uh, that the players have to try to reach some type of solution that's there. But I have faith, uh, Sam, Sam Tito, because you know not just in the United States but across this country. We, but we know in the United States that they, we now have the the you know a generation that is the most multicultural, the most accepting, the most uh, intolerant uh, ever in our history. And I think that those minds will all come together and we will be able to reach some type of solution uh, in the Middle East where everyone will be able to really coexist together uh, in a brotherhood. And, and that's that's what I believe and that's what I got out of the conversation that we've had here today, Santita, is that it's a complex situation, but it can be resolved. We just have to figure out what that solution is. Yeah, what did Dr. King say? Uh, Dr. Malvo, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Therein lies a choice. There's a choice we have to make. And unfortunately, the entrenched political party are entrenched. They are, and they've, they've done everything from a bifurcated way. It's either mm -hmm. this or that. And what we know, with uh, especially with some of the economic solutions, is that you can't say this or that. That we have to figure out a way. I mean, we have the former president, let me be nice. Um, talking about <laughs> getting rid of social security. And then you have people who, who cross that threshold like me, you're like, oh, no, you're not going to take my money. And at the same time, we do know, we do know that there are some economic constraints that we have a lot of debt. Uh, uh, you know, that's, the, those no label people intrigue me, but I don't think they're, you know, they're seeing themselves as alternatives well, I, I think they see themselves as something bipartisan, but you see, they couldn't even find a candidate. So, you know, the, 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 the sort, of, sort of bifurcation is troubling. I wish we could get to a multi-party system mm -hmm. where essentially you have to make the same kind of compromises that other countries make to create a cabinet. Someone comes and say, I, I'll join your cabinet if you give me this. So I'll mm -hmm. join if you give me that. You end up with a comprehensive as opposed to something that's just either or is it sometimes it's both mm -hmm. well no the team of rivals at lincoln did that one yes that, that's, yeah. a, that's a real doris burns put her foot in that book it's a great mm -hmm. book so really except for ways people can work together well you know mm -hmm. that's what lonnie guineer was was reaching for maybe that's why they didn't want her in government she said we don't need to have and the immature form of government attorney terry o'neill is one where i win you lose you lose i win no. right she said, you have to find a way for everybody to get something. May she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. And that is how, you know, see, I'm from a family of five kids. Nobody trusted and believed got their way, okay? <laughs> Not completely, oh no. And my right. parents were like, even when we knew that you were right and your, one of your siblings was wrong, no, 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 we had to make it right. Because <laughs> my mother said, if you think our two votes your five little votes had as much weight as mine too. I believe in democracy, but that's not how this works. He said, your father and I were the check on your foolishness <laughs> and, the, and your lack of wisdom. That's, that's what we did. Attorney O'Neill, why don't you wrap this up for us? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say, um, first of all, I love uh, Dr. Malvo's uh, idea of the multi, uh, a multi-party system. We so need to go there because so, so to me, the idea is nobody gets everything they want. Everybody gets something that they want. Yes. The, the something is where all the conversations happen. And the other thing I will say is that, that you know, Daryl Jones talks about the future and the young people of the country. That's because he's in touch with some of the most brilliant minds of Generation Z and, uh, and, and um, I mean, Generation, yeah, Gen Z and, and millennials because he's been training them Mm -hmm. for years at the Transformative Justice Coalition, training them in, in voting rights and in civic engagement. And he knows what he's talking about when he's talking mm -hmm. about the young people. They really do. Um, they, have, they have brilliant, amazing ideas and they are, they are going to be the future and I hope that continues. So yeah, we just have to keep thinking this through. Absolutely, John. Um, um, I would say to your listeners, to your listeners, you can make a difference. 
Find out what you believe is right and go after it with clarity and honesty and integrity, and you will make a difference. That's it. Thank you. Well, you know, I thank you. And be in coalition with people. You'd be surprised. You're going to make some new friends. I know I have. I haven't even met Josh. He's a friend. Ari, help me to move. Ari, <laughs> move. Ari, move. That's my sweet. <laughs> well, what are your closing thoughts, Ari? Well, there's a couple of things that came up in our conversation that I wanted to, um, you know, mix notes about. One of them is about taxes. And, you know, we've got tax day coming up on, on Monday, but also just like where our like spending powers are and things like that. And there's a huge push amongst like all of the voting and like to really appeal to people's, um, you know, feelings around like where money is and like where money for black weapons is going and all of this. This is like critically important. It's always really critically important to you know share um, money is going. But I think we have to also be really careful about the conversation and uh, about this dynamic because it can turn into a we shouldn't be supporting a genocide because we want to build a school. Like that's and so like that's a difficult like, thing around like morality. And I think striking that balance is like so deeply important because the truth is. Everything could be funded if they want to fund it. That's the point of the military spending. There's money for the military when they want there to be. There's money for banks when they want there to be money for banks. There's money for the military when they want there to be military. There's not money for their communities when there needs to be money for the communities. But I think it's really tricky, and I know a lot of like, groups like that are like really trying to like put that needle. Um, the other thing that came up is about like you know Hulk. The memory of the Holocaust, which is obviously being viewed narratively all the time. Um, I think it's like really important that you think about a little bit of a larger frame here, which is that this is not about Jews. This is not even really about Israelis. This is about world leaders using nationalism and really keeping people against each other as they've been for a long time in terms of creating military organs and the military uh, whole access for, for U.S. capital to extract out of the Middle East. What this is about at the end of the day, it is not about Jews, it's not about a place for, you know, for folks who are spoken like the Holocaust, it is about the ability for capitalists to extract resources from the Middle East and to do it under military touch. And so I think it's like really important that people see this not as just a you know thing contained to Jews and Palestinians. This is about the way that world powers are manipulating folks um, all like over the place. And of course, the Israeli government is you know committing genocide because we're doing here, and they're doing that because they want to be like these global powers that are also acting the resources of the And we've seen that from all of the environmental colonialism that like we see happening in, in Israel too. We see that from where all like the water is coming from, where it's being built and all that. It's all about extracting resources from black and brown people. And like I think that is a kind of narrative that all like really like um, in, in a lot of ways. Um and um yeah, so that's, that's all I got. But in terms of like solutions that are like out there, it's obviously really scary. We've got what, 300, 400,000 dollars in the West Bank over just like the last decade. Um, I mean, I got beat up by Israeli authorities out of these places. Like, I, this is like, I mean, the settlements are very, very, the idea of a one state solution is going to be like incredibly tough. But I think that. What I'm supposed to hold in this moment is that nothing is possible until it happens. And we've seen that like throughout history, that like nothing actually happens until it actually happens. It's always seen as impossible. It's always seen as it couldn't happen. People said this about South Africa, people have said this about Libya, people have said this about all sorts of countries that like real fundamental change like happen. And I think like we have to maintain the smallest amount of hope there that like we could see transformative change. Dr. Quigley? Yeah, um, yeah, I don't have any overall solutions. I would just mention a couple of things that I think people could focus on uh, immediately, namely in the month of April. Um, one is that the United States is still refusing to fund the UN Relief and Works Agency. 
which, which is an abomination. Um, we, we talked about how Israel should do more to allow humanitarian assistance, uh, and we're cutting off the agency that has the capability of distributing uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, and nobody seems to be talking about this. The other, and this is also happening in the month of April, the Security Council of the UN is going to be considering whether Palestine should be admitted uh, as a member of the United Nations. Um, and that's Palestine being admitted to the UN isn't going to solve everything, <laughs> um, uh, but, but at least it, it gives the Palestinians uh, a voice at the international level. Uh, and the, the only state that's standing in the way uh, of that, <laughs> I, I don't need to name to this audience, is, is of course, our own, our own government. Uh, uh, so I think they need to be pushed on that issue uh, as well. So those, those two small things. Well, you know, those are all the bricks that build the building, everybody. And all the little quarks out here in the atmosphere come give you the molecules. It give you the give you the give you the give us the people and the world that we are. We can not just do better. We can do right. We can do right by people, and we're not going to be blessed, quite frankly, until we do. So I pray for the people of Israel. I pray for the people of Palestine, because you know what? One of the beautiful things about God is the dirty, the funny little joke is this that you have a table, you have a place at the table, but it's in the presence of your enemy because your enemy is God's child too. How about that? We're all wedded to each other and you will find that your opposite is really, you all are two sides of the same coin. Keep on living, you, that is what you see. So we're all locked into this ship together called the world, okay? Let's figure it out. Let's work it out. And we can. Thank you, Beatles. We can work it out. We can work it out. Very powerful, Cynthia. Life is very short, and there is no time. We can work it out. We can work it out. I'm Sam Tita Jackson. I thank you, Dr. Malvo, and my panel for carrying on. I knew that you would. Over boom, I'm sending you so much love. Love